It's 1 p.m. in Los Angeles on Friday, the 30th of November, 2012. I'm Mark Strassman, reporter with Utopia News. I'm about to talk to Lisa Guernsey, who's the director of the Early Education Initiative at the New America Foundation and the author of Screen Time, How Electronic Media from Baby Videos to Educational Software Affects Your Young Child. Welcome to Utopia News. Hi. Thanks, Mark. Glad to be thanks here. Thanks for showing us a copy of the book. Um, what is the Early Education Initiative? are part of a think tank uh, and we do a lot of research on children birth to age eight and what learning environments are best for them and how to scale up those environments so that they're available to all children um, regardless of parental income regardless of socioeconomic status so that more and more kids in our country have the ability to to learn and be prepared for school what's your role as director what do you do there I edit a blog called Early Ed Watch. I also um, I have a team of writers and analysts, and we put out papers on everything from how to look at kindergarten data all the way up through what it means to be a good preschool teacher. And we do a lot of work and outreach to Capitol Hill, State Departments of Education, uh, education associations to raise awareness of early education issues. And what more specific things do you do to, to get your message out there? Uh, well, as so we've got a blog, we use Twitter, um, Facebook, a lot of um, commentary in different uh, publications, magazines, newspapers, and, and books. The, the book that we'll be talking about is one that's not directly focused on policy, but is about thinking more deeply about how children, young children learn and what their environment looks like. And so we, our, our staff covers a lot of terrain trying to get the word out. Summarize as best you can what message you're trying to convey in terms of uh, early education for, uh, for young children. Our, our message is that if we aren't careful in this country, our, our kids are going to really fall behind. Certain groups of children who don't have access to really good learning environments will be falling behind and will just be playing catch up once they get to school. Uh, we also need to be focusing on the early grades of school so that we're using that time to really help children be prepared to learn to read, see themselves as learners, understand how to explore the world. Uh, and, and basically it's about building a foundation for success for, for kids of, of all demographics. Is there a crisis in this situation now, do you think, that, that there are substantial portions of the, of the population of children who aren't getting what they need? I, I do. I mean, I, it, it's, it's a crisis in some states and not so much in others because in some states, in some communities, you have leaders who are really thinking about this and who recognize that it's important to put more resources um, towards the early years of children's lives. And then in other places, it's completely forgotten and we're not, we're not doing what we can to give those children what they need. And so um, what you find in some places is that there might be parents who are paying upwards of $20,000 a year to have two children in a high quality childcare setting, for example, and those children are getting some of the, um, the, the hands-on learning and the, and the book reading and the read-alouds that they need throughout the day. And other children, um, their, their parents can't afford a really good kind of preschool setting like that. And those children, as, as much as those parents might be wanting and, and are doing what they can to help them, are, are really not getting a, a really deep learning experience until they hit kindergarten or first grade when their, their teachers uh, realize, oh my gosh, I have so much work to do just to bring this child up to the same level as the other children. And then that changes and colors the climate in that classroom for all children because it's so hard to differentiate instruction between those who are prepared and those who aren't. So and the reading scores alone in this country are an indicator of how much work there is still to do and we are finding that as much as two-thirds of children in this country are not reading proficiently by the end of third grade. They're not reading at grade level, not reading well enough to be able to do their homework well. And until we fix the early education problems and the lack of access, we're really not going to start seeing some of those reading scores uh, go up, for example. So the problem is that uh, the children who are deprived bring down the, uh, everyone else when they get to, the, uh, get to kindergarten and first grade. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly wouldn't want to blame those children for that. I don't think it's that they're necessarily kind of bringing down the kids and that it's their, their fault. But they do need a lot, they need a lot of attention. They, they may have been in situations for many years when they weren't really given a lot of attention in terms of how to, how to um, 
self-regulate, to kind of control their impulses, to be able to sit and listen, to follow directions, to take a task and kind of follow through on it, to um, respond to a story, to put sentences together and and actually have a conversation with the, with the children around them. They hadn't been exposed to anything like that. And so it does require teachers to spend more time um, helping to bring those children along. And that can happen at the risk of ch teachers not having the time for children who are already there. Okay, so uh, we've set the scene in terms of the general issues involving early childhood education. I want to talk now about the role played by electronic media in all this, which is the subject of your book. Um, uh, how have your own children's involvement in electronic devices been good for you to help you uh, find the answers and the questions that you're, you've been looking at? Yeah, so I, should say I have two children, and they're now in elementary school, but when I was writing the book, they were very young. They're one and three years old when I started the research for the book, and my main question was, are they learning anything from the TV, from video, from even these kind of computer games that are supposedly aimed at preschoolers? Are they really getting anything out of this? And, and my second question was, oh gosh, could it be harmful to them in any way? Um, and certainly sometimes the headlines in the media might lead us to think so. So what I, the, the bottom line from my book and from three years of research looking um, at what developmental science tells us, as well as all sorts of uh, media research and, and um, children's psychology, is that it's a, it's a complicated picture, but if parents think about the three C's, they will have an easier time making good choices for their children. And those three C's are looking at the content of what's on the screen, understanding the context surrounding the use of the technology, everything from how it fits in that child's day and daily routine to whether the child's actually interacting with what's on screen versus just on it passively letting it sweep over them. And then the fourth C is the individual child for parents to really tune into their own child and, and really look at whether it's stuff on they're seeing on the screen is upsetting to them or maybe it's sparking their curiosity and leading them to want to discover new things and ask more questions and if that's the case it can really be a springboard to learning. How ubiquitous is screen time for young toddlers these days including both television and interactive devices like iPads and iPhones? We, we have some data from Common Sense Media it put out a report a, a year ago called Zero to Eight, and I don't have the exact statistics at my fingertips, but the bottom line is that media is quite, uh, quite common in the lives of young children, even down to six months of age or even, even before. At the very early end, it's, it's often um, background TV, which is the most detrimental, and some of the research that I'm looking at it shows that that can be... Um, really what we should be putting our attention on is how to eliminate background TV and adult directed TV that's being um, that children are exposed to at very young ages. Um, by the time children are two, three, and four years old there are a lot of children these days who are using iPads and other touchscreen devices and doing more interactive things as well as there's lots of, of, of TV use. Um, it, it varies from an hour a day to in some families it's multiple hours a day. There are other families who decide to not have any TV use but are very, um, very happy to give their children apps and feel that interactive games are far better for them than TV. And then when you get up into the elementary ages, you see that children have their own devices and that adds to their, quote, screen time, if that's what you want to call it, where children um, might be using those devices to look at music uh, videos in addition to listening to music, or maybe they're even chatting with their friends. By the time they're in, say, elementary school, they might often be using those devices for, for language and, and chatting, as well as simply playing games um, and, and being involved in that kind of activity. Now, this is the first generation of children to have this much exposure to this much screen time. What are you finding the effects are? Well, the effects depend on those three C's that I mentioned. That's why it's really hard to say this is like, you know, the end of the world or this is a great thing. Um, I, I think we have to be really careful to not um, paint such a broad brush across all of technology and, and say, okay, the effect is going to be X, or the effects is going to be Y. So just to give you an example, um, we are finding that, like I said, with background television, adult directed TV that very young children are exposed to, the effects can be lower language skills, not lower uh, scores on tests of being able to kind of concentrate and focus and follow directions and we're seeing we can see that in, in children um, starting at age one up through age four 
However, on the other side, and when it comes to content that's well designed for young children that has been uh, vetted by those who have an understanding of child development that is aimed at helping them learn a new concept or giving them a window onto something they haven't seen before, we have research that shows that that could be quite helpful to children, especially disadvantaged kids who haven't had a lot of exposure to this in any other setting. And so everything from the older Sesame Street research all the way up to some stuff that we're seeing now that's coming out. Uh, George, Georgetown University had done a study on interactive um, games and young children, young as, as three years old, uh, being able to learn better from interactive games than from what they might see on, on video and being able to use that information to then do something off screen to actually transfer that learning into the real world, which is what we really want to get to. So you're saying some screen time is bad for children and some, some screen time is good, depending on the context, the content, and the uh, particular yeah. child. Exactly, yes. And I mean, I know that that may seem like it's not as satisfying an answer for those who want um, to be able to say, oh, it's terrible, we must do something about it. But I think what it means is that we, we need more research on those different things, the content, the context, and the child. We need more guides and guidance um, given to parents on how to make good choices. And we need to be thinking about the parent ecology and the family ecology so that parents feel like they can have the time to relax and, and just enjoy being with their children instead of feeling like they always have to be putting on a TV as a babysitter or feeling like they're rushing to and fro and having to um, rely so much on the technology instead of themselves for their interactions. Uh, have a functional MRIs been done of children to see how they react to different screens and, and the content there? Yeah, there, there have, yes. Um, MRI technology has been used. I describe it a little bit in, in my book. I don't um, rely d directly on it because we have only a few studies so far. Um, one of the things that's uh, that we need to be careful about in some of those studies is that just because uh, some things lighting up in the brain, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is something that the child is going to retain or that they're they're really learning from. Um, but there is some research uh, that's showing that for, um, it's not so much MRI research actually as eye tracking research that shows for infants and toddlers, um, there's something different going on for them than there might be for an adult or even an older child when they actually look at a screen. And so they're trying to process information um, and the eye the eye tracking information gives us a sense of how they're trying to process that information. And it can be uh, much more difficult for them to see the different scene changes, to kind of be tracking from one thing to another. And some of the eye tracking data shows us that it takes children longer to kind of be able to understand what's going on on the screen when they're at very young ages. Uh, than when they're older and have some experience and their brain has some experience in recognizing the imagery on the screen and understanding that we've done a scene change now or understanding that this is now a flashback or understanding that a character is coming in from one side and going out the other. These are all some of the pieces of digital literacy and screen literacy that, that children learn over time and that we can't assume that they just know as soon as they're you know, one years old. Okay, on the, on the positive side, are uh, interactive applications capable of really accelerating the learning curve for young children? I, I think that there is some potential there, but we do not have a lot of research to go on right now. So I mentioned a study from Georgetown University that showed that interactivity um, was better than video for children at about three years of age in terms of their ability to understand what was being told to them and then use that information. It was a hide and seek game is what it was and children um, were supposed to take the information from that hide and seek game and then go and actually play the hide and seek game in a room where um, where puppets were hiding and they found that the children who had experienced that in an interactive way uh, were able to do something with that information whereas the kids who just saw it in video uh, really didn't know what to do when they got back kind of into the real world. So uh, there are just a, a couple of studies like that that are giving us a glimpse of what interactivity might mean for very young kids. I think we have to do a lot more work on that front that we need to be funding a lot more research in this area because young children are so um, exposed to this and because, you know, I'm a parent. I, I get it. It's can, it can be really, if you see a cool app and you're like, oh my gosh, check this out. Let's play this. Um, so, and, and the way parents interact with their children around the media, that needs to be studied too, because that may be actually where some of the most positive interaction is happening around the media. Um, talk about the digital divide in this context. You've already said that, 
that some children are uh, are less uh, uh, privileged when it comes to the stimulation and the kinds of stimulation that they get. Uh, what is the cost of uh, of an iPad going to do to uh, the distribution of some of these uh, learning opportunities? Right. So this is something that's been talked about quite a bit, actually, in the education space, and it's been called the app gap, that common sense media report that I mentioned a little while ago that came out last year, gave it a term to this new digital divide, that calling it the app gap. And, um, and, and I, th I think that there is certainly a, a concern um, that children in affluent households that have access to this will have yet more kind of interesting conversation provoking stimulating games to play um, and that those in disadvantaged households who can't afford a $500 iPad, iPad and whose parents don't want them you know, constantly downloading apps even if they're only for two bucks a pop that those children won't have access to this but I would say that we maybe should be looking as closely at how technology is being used in different families um, as we are right now just looking at what technology is being used in these families because in some other research we're seeing that how parents and other adults like teachers how parents interact with their children around the technology is very different in families um, of, of high education and high economic the socioeconomic status versus families with struggling parents who themselves haven't had a lot of education or had a lot of um, interaction uh, around these things in the past. And we know from the research on child development that it's the way parents interact with their children that's fostering their language development, their understanding of new concepts, their um, the, the modeled behavior of how to go and search something online or to learn something new or to ask questions about what you're seeing, that that's what really matters. And so it may be that the digital divide that we really should be focusing on is the divide in, in how we approach the technology and, and how parents use it with their children. Is there a movement of education for parents and uh, that's designed to help them become better uh, educators of their children both in the digital and non-digital realms? We need that movement. I mean, that, that's actually a great question and that's exactly what um, I've been working on for the past year or so. We have a new report coming out from um, the grade level reading campaign but that the New America Foundation uh, is writing along with the Joan Gantz Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop and in that report we are, are putting out the idea that we really need to create new spaces and communities where parents and educators um, and their children can kind of come together around both digital media and traditional media um, to talk about what they're seeing to have you know book clubs or movie clubs uh, all sorts of um, movie creating um, experiences, anything that helps children and their parents and their teachers talk together around print media or digital media is going to foster more language development and more, uh, or m just more skill in the future. And that's really what we need. Have, has as evidence arisen in your research of, about uh, interactive media, about whether this changes some theories of child development or whether the theories of child development are staying intact and just being applied to these new technologies. So far, the theories of child development are, are, are staying intact for the most part. Uh, we're, we're finding that the, the theories around the children's, children's need to play, their, the importance of attachment from, uh, with a parent, the um, importance of those back and forth interactions that lead to language development, all of that is absolutely still there and just needs to be applied to the digital media realm. But I would add that I'm curious, and, I, and I'd love to see some research on this, I am curious if we're going to find that children have more capacity for learning than we thought because we're going to be able to test it in new ways with these iPad-like devices. Until now, we didn't have a way to really get into the minds of, say, a one- or two-year-old, a child who wasn't very verbal or a child who didn't have much agility in using a mouse. And so it was hard to really know what they could do. But the fact that the iPad, for example, or an Android um, device with a touch, interactive touch screen, the fact that that enables a child with just a touch of their finger to be able to point to objects, make things happen, move things around, communicate in a new way, that could lead us to a better understanding of what they really know and what they really don't. Um, will, 
So based on what you said about uh, content, context, and the child itself, him or herself, it's obvious you're not going to say that there are limits that people should place on the use of, of digital media, but rather guidelines as to how to get the best use out of it. What would you say those guidelines are? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that, that that's right. But I, I want to add just one thing about limits. I, I'm not somebody who says that there needs to be some national limit out there, um, X number of hours per day. I will say, however, that there's research that shows that families that put limits on their children that make sense for their family, that those can be a very good thing. Children, of course, they need boundaries. We see this in not just in digital media, but anywhere. And there's research that shows that having a rule in place can help children make some sense of the world around them and that those who have rules around uh, TV use, for instance, no matter what the rule is, the children who have some kind of rules around the use of TV are often the children who are doing better in school. Um, but, but So that said, I think that um, parents need to find out what's going to work for them, what fits with their kind of worldview of what their children need. In the back of my book, I have a chapter that goes through different parents' um, I interviewed a bunch of parents for the book, and I asked them, well, what are the rules that you put in place? Um, how do you do this? Do you limit screen time X number of hours per day, or do you do something around content? How does it make, how does it work for you? And by looking at those stories, other families might get some ideas. Um, everything from, I have one family said, if it's dark outside, um, or if it's light outside, we can have screen time. If, the, if it's dark outside, we can't. I had another family that said, um, Nothing during the week, anything goes during the weekend. I mean, I think it, it really does come down to parents making some, some calculated decisions about what makes sense, sense for them. Um, despite the, uh, uh, the advertising to that effect, have you seen that the use of some of these apps and the use of uh, uh, interactive uh, digital technology is, is capable of producing a quanti qualitatively different kind of child or uh, that, that differs from previous generations in their breadth of understanding and their agility, their mental agility, or uh, are, are we seeing sort of this, the same levels of development uh, even with these uh, added electronic devices? Well, I, I don't think we know <laughs> the answer to that question at all yet. I mean, it's really fascinating to think about. Um, what is what does this mean for the next generation? So 25 years from now, what are these adults going to look like? Um, I, I would I would caution us to imagine uh, a, a completely different uh, brain <laughs> that's being formed, only because of what we're seeing in just child development research in general around the importance of interactions, uh, no matter what those interactions are with uh, adults, um, digital media, siblings. And so um, unless we see something really drastically different in the way children and adults and children and their peers start interacting on a, on a very large basis, I don't expect to see huge changes in the way these these children kind of grow up to be adults. Does okay. That a yes, it does. It does. Um, I, I'm wondering, though, what we're talking about here is the, the details of becoming a digital native, of, of growing up from the very beginning with, uh, with apps as part of your, your lifestyle, so to speak. And I'm wondering, it's obviously a big question, but could you give some general ideas about how you think this is going to impact a, a Google's bottom line for advertising? Because people are going to be uh, hooked on watching their screens from an early age, and they're going to consider it perfectly normal to do it throughout their life, and we're generally going to have a more app-oriented and less uh, human interactive-oriented population. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I certainly, myself, as a, a, a parent and an adult with my own, you know, device, um, feel the twitch, and I think a lot of us do, right, that, that we want to be connected all the time, and um, so does that mean that companies like Google or others that have some advertising around the spaces that we always want to be connected to are going to do well? Probably. Uh, I, would, I would think that that's probably um, a smart place for advertisers to be putting their money. Um, but I, I do wonder if we're going to have to kind of recalibrate a little bit as human beings um, so that we can f figure out ways to be both connected the way you and I are, and have that be really purposeful or meaningful. Um, but oh, sorry, my phone's ringing. But also to ignore, um, to be able to uh, see this as a case in point. It is. 
ignore distractions. I have too many phones and too much technology. Um, so to be to be able to find places where we can have some real space to be connected, whether it's in a, this way or in person, but in a really meaningful way, and not constantly feel like we're in five different places at one time. I I, I feel like you know as as human beings in civilization, we're going to have to work this out and figure out how to how to keep ourselves present in the moment. Okay. Well, your your research and policy uh, advocacy has done a lot to help that process, and I want to thank you for for your work and for talking to us about it today on Utopia News. Great. Th thank you, Mark, for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye.